Hi everyone, my name is Geeta. I'm the creative producer of The Capital here at RMIT. Thank you for joining us for Visions, Speculations and Dystopias, a deep dive into Spaceship Earth. So just a bit of housekeeping, if you're having trouble hearing me, we recommend turning the volume on your Vimeo window up to full. So that's the little blue sound bar on the bottom right of the, Vime of the Vimeo window, and then adjust your laptop or other devices volume up or down. Um, we're all still here virtually in Melbourne, but we'll be reopening our physical doors early next year. Um, it will be lovely to know if you visited our theatre in real life since we renovated and reopened the doors last year. If you just want to put a little yes or a no in the chat box, um, just interesting for us to know who's been and who hasn't. And of course, if you haven't, we look forward to inviting you back next, well, inviting you in next year. So we are, of course, all meeting tonight from various locations. And before we go further, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Woi Wurrung and Boon Wurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands I'm speaking from today. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands across Australia or New Zealand, wherever you, our audience, are joining us from. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders, past and present. Okay, Spaceship Earth, what a film. Theatre, hippies, vegetables, ships, biospheres, climate change, the media, banana bread, Goldman Sachs, and of course the longest ISO project of all time. What a truly amazing year to release this film. Um, it'll be great to know who of you watched the film last night. Um, did, you watch, did you watch it? Put a yes in the chat box or maybe you watched it another day, you can let us know that too. Um, we're looking forward to reading your thoughts and comments about it, so feel free to write in the chat um, as well as questions. Just let us know what you what you thought, were you inspired, were you challenged, were you provoked? I'm sure you've got lots of opinions. So tonight we bring you a panel conversation titled Ground Control to Lockdown Town, Should We Leave Earth? Provocations from Science, Speculative Design and Science Fiction. We have three experts from RMIT joining me today. They are Professor Michelle G, Director of the Sir Lawrence Wackett Centre, RMIT's Aerospace and Defence Centre, and she's also a Professor of Aerospace Engineering. Michelle is our resident space nerd, so get ready for all your space questions to Michelle. We also have speculative designer, Dr. Oli Kotzaftis, whose practice takes in climate resilience and innovation. So when trying to explain what Ollie does, I usually say he's the guy who figures out how to make buildings from algae or wine bottles out of garbage, but he can explain this much more eloquently than me. And we also have speculative fiction writer, Dr. Rose Michael, who amongst many other things has published two novels and is currently working on, on a book chapter on Australian dystopian speculative fiction with Jane Rawson called Writing Crisis, Reading Crises. Rose will be leading the conversation, discussing all things science and science fiction behind this grand experiment. So before I hand over to you, Rose, given we're about to get deeply into sci-fi territory, um, I thought I would just let everyone tell us what their favourite sci-fi film was and we, um, Tim will have a look at those posters on the screen. And um, audience, if you want to put in the chat what your favourite ones are. So we're looking at um, Aliens is actually Isabella. So Isabella is our wonderful chat moderator who is not on the screen at the moment, but we'll let, we'll let Isabella go first. Rose, what, what, was, what did you pick? Tim, can we bring up the volume for Rose? Sorry, Rose, just hang on a sec. Ollie, do you want to tell us what yours is? Yeah, for sure. Well, the one on screen is definitely uh, one of my choices, but the one that I picked is actually Years on Years, which is a British TV series that was shot just recently, like in 2018, 2019. And what I love about it is that um, it's a speculation on the near future in the next 15 years. And um, in, co in opposition to what you find traditionally in, uh, in science fiction movie, where the future is just there and it's already described in all its glory and splendor, in that movie, the future just drops in regularly as it would in a normal life. 
So you know, there's always this quote about the future is uh, already exists, it's just unevenly distributed. And that's exactly what the, the TV show talks about. Fantastic show, I highly recommend it. <laughs> yeah, I loved it too. Rose, should we try back? Let's just try your volume because if we can't hear you, this is it's something we have to fix. Do you want to start telling no, us No, I think I'm film? fine. <laughs> yeah, so I picked a, I picked Arrival, which is based on the Ted Chang short story, The Story of Your Life, both of which are just beautiful works of art. And I guess one of the things that I love so much about it is the narrative surprise. It's not... Um, the whole plot doesn't hang on a reveal. It's not like solve the puzzle and the story is over. It's a detailed, subtle working through of the consequences of a line of thinking. Wonderful. And Michelle, what was yours? Well, my first choice was Aliens and I thought, you know, it's sort of science fiction horror. And then I went to, I think, the movie that got me into science fiction and science in general, which is Logan's Run. Um, I remember watching this as a kid and, um, you know, it's a little bit psychedelic um, and it kind of, um, it's kind of aligned somewhat with, um, with, with the movie space, um, Spaceship Earth. People are living in a sort of a domed, protected environment and no one lives past the age of 30 because what they do, it, it looks like a utopia from the, at, at the outset and it's um, a, a, a amazingly visual and, um, and colourful and it turns out to be quite dystopian because the reason why no one lives past the age of 30 is that they kill them so that everyone else can survive. <laughs> this sort of ties in with my choice which was um, Jonathan Glazer's Under the Skin which um, is honestly one of my favourite films of all time. It's um, it's it's got hints of I don't know if I even want to tell if anyone hasn't seen it I feel like I don't even want to tell you what it is you just need to you just need to see it, it has ties to what Michelle just said but it's um, I will tell you Scarlett Johansson plays um, an alien and it's a com it's a complete reversal of um, the male gaze so she's basically using the female gaze to prey on men and I'll and I'll kind of yeah leave it at that so that we um, can get on to talking about what we came to talk about, which is Spaceship Earth. Um, just for the audience, we will circle back to questions from you um, at about uh, a little after 6.30 because we've started a bit late. So please put your questions in. We are seeing them, we are noting them down, and we will come back to them um, if we can at 6.30. If there's time during while everyone's talking, I'll, I'll pop in and, um, and ask some questions. But for now, Rose, over to you. Thanks very much, Geeta, and welcome for everyone else who's here. I thought that we might um, start our discussion about this audacious experiment with focusing on how it speaks quite unexpectedly to our own recent lockdown realities. Um, so perhaps we'll play a clip of those first moments. Uh, let's face it, that's why I watched it, which I had done even before being invited to this panel. I went into the wilderness area, which is the area that I was managing. And I rained, I turned the rain on. just to wash all the air, thinking, okay, let's just wash all this other stuff out of here and begin anew. The reality that it was just the eight of us in this amazing new world started to hit. You can think and think and think and think about, oh, I'm going away for two years, but just suddenly, wow, we're here. You know, we were pioneers. We were the first biospherians. 
there was also this pride. Hey, you've given us a new world to, you know, figure out how to live in, and we're going to grow up with this thing. We're going to take care of it. Thanks. Um, it's so interesting. I mean, this wacko, wild, weird idea. Um, but looking at that clip again, even, there's this big difference between their experience of lockdown. They got to plan. They knew that it was going to happen. And yet when I watch it again, one of the things I'm struck by is how much we all suddenly really appreciated that one hour of walking and these sort of small areas in our little local biospheres that we didn't realise were right near us, that we didn't realise sounded like that, felt like that, smelt like that, and that kind of intimate knowledge that came out of it. So I guess I wanted to ask you each, Ollie, I might start with you, is just about um, sharing how the Space Shift Earth experience related to your own recent stay in place experience during COVID-19 and whether there's any connections with what went wrong for them or what went right for you, how you managed, what you might do differently. One of the questions we had from an audience member prior to even starting was what what might we learn for Biosphere 3? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, hey, everybody, by the way. Um, I think it's, it's pretty different situations, actually, because when you think about it, these people that were locked up for like two years in this like huge space uh, did that by choice. Um, so here we, uh, we were in lockdown in Melbourne for the last six months, but that was an obligation. We didn't have a choice. Um, and, and I see like just there, there's a massive difference between the experience that they had and the what that we had uh, ourselves. Um, the other... Um, the other difference maybe is like when they, these people, like the, the biosphere entered the biosphere, um, they had alignments with a, a bigger purpose, a higher vision. Uh, they had the drive to like try to create or understand how we could live in enclosed spaces. And for us, it's uh, like just like what we lived through just over the last six months was, again, very different. Yes, we had a goal. We wanted to like um, flatten that wave as the expression goes, uh, but, but very different topic once again. And, and the third one is um, uh, we were all living in our micro bubbles or houses uh, while these guys had access to, I would say, thousand square meters of space with rainforest and, and a beach and an ocean to swim in even though it was all artificial uh, there was some kind of a, a natural aspect that they were immersed in which was very different i'm sure some the experiences that most melbourneans have lived through over the last six months that's right one of the things that one of the reasons why i had watched it as a speculative fiction writer um, prior to this panel was this audacious experiment, you know, this steel and grass, glass structure that included a rainforest, a savanna, a coral reef. I mean, you're right, there is, there's nothing like our experience in that regard, except that once they went in and they shut down, they had this reality of eight people for, for two years. Um, what about you, Michelle? I wonder um, whether you have a different perspective on the relationship between an experiment like this and this kind of experiment that we didn't sign up for, that, that I do think has been aligned to a greater purpose, exactly, of flattening the curve, a kind of abstract idea. It's very unusual and I find quite inspiring to think that people have been motivated by a very long-term abstract goal that isn't necessarily dire directly related, you know, to their own short-term future. Yeah, uh, look, I, I agree with a lot of what Ollie said, um, but I do have some other points. I think that um, in some respects, the Biosphere 2 people had it harder. We were locked down, but we had, you know, toilet paper and food at our fingertips once the toilet paper reappeared on the shelves. Um, we didn't have to, you know, they were growing all of their own food. They were trying to generate their own atmosphere with the plants that they were growing. And you saw in the film how after a period of time, the carbon dioxide levels started increasing. That would have been pretty stressful. And, you know, you're, they were also, um, I don't know that they chose each other. Bar two, I don't think that they chose each other. And I think that that would have been really quite difficult. Um, lockdown for us, um, you, you got to, well, after a point in time, we got to bubble with people of our choice. We could go on 
um, socially distanced walks with people of our choice within our five kilometer radius. Um, I, 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 think, I think it would have been tougher for them. I, I, I take the point that they did it by choice and they had a grander vision. Um, I think that Melbourne's lockdown was also something that we did by choice. Sure, there might have been the government trying to enforce these restrictions, but there was every opportunity to act up if we wanted to, and by and large, most people chose not to. So I think we did it out of choice as well. One of the things I'm interested in that touches on what you mentioned there is the way that this documentary really reclaims almost a contested history around this experiment. You know, was it a scientific success? Was it a publicity stunt? And, and do we have to choose between these two realities, these two truths? Is it one, you know, or is it the other? Must it be either or? Um, I, I think there's this great clip actually um, that we might play about, you know, the point the point is to fail. No one really knew what we need if we're ever going to go into space on a permanent basis. We don't see how big the process is. John Allen had suggested, well, the whole point of this is not to do rigorous science from the get-go. The point of this is to learn how to make a biosphere that can support human occupants in an extraterrestrial setting. It won't work the first time. It probably won't work for the first several times, but each time we're likely to learn more faster. I mean, it's got a very interesting motivation around this experiential learning, which I just found really fascinating. The fact that these, um, these people who went went in to this experiment put themselves under. There's this classic line, one of them says, I don't think of us being locked up. I think of us locking everyone else out, <laughs> which reveals a certain mindset. Um, but this idea that they didn't go in there knowing how to grow orchards, they didn't go in there, you know, knowing how to do science. The idea was that, that they would learn that they would learn on the job, they would learn from books. And actually, you know, their background is, is this collective activism, this theatre background, which is a really big, fascinating part of the documentary, is the projects that they had done decades earlier that had prepared them, I guess, for this experiment. Ollie, I remember you saying that you talked about their passion and drive being inspirational. And I wonder about this idea, are they ahead of their time? Were they ahead of their time? And, and how would you talk to what that means for you to see a project like this yeah um i just want to say like i found this documentary really fascinating like i was alive when this uh this came uh this came up in 1991 i remember it clearly in the media what i didn't know about was all the backstory of these people knowing that for the last 20 the previous 20 years before uh, they locked themselves up in this biosphere too they they achieved so much as a group um, they all like um, came together uh, during university time, started like uh, a theater troupe, um, established a ranch, then built a boat, and none of them knew how to do that. Uh, then traveled the world, mm -hmm. built an hotel in Kathmandu, an art gallery in London, a ranch in Australia. I think like, yeah, the, the drive, the vision, and the uh, entrepreneurship of, of this group of people is, is to be commended. And, and, and it's kind of interesting to see that potentially back in the days, it was almost easier to develop this kind of projects um, as uh, it is now. Um, for me, like when I look at it, I always think about like, a, you know, like a, the, the rise of capitalism since World War II and the, even before the industrial era. And the peak capitalism really was like the 80s and the 90s where everything was possible. Since then, we started to understand the, the, consequ the unintended consequences of that. And people are a lot more um, um, maybe... Um, not as excited about developing this big project but when we think about what was happening at the time and when we replace it in the context of the 80s and the 90s this kind of project were actually happening quite a lot so i remember like for example in uh, in the 60s in the us there was another experimental study that just um, that was proposed 
Minnesota Experimental City never came to life, but the, the, the design of it was just fantastic. In uh, 68 in India, there was Oroville. In, uh, 70, in the 70s, there was like uh, this other uh, dream city in Arizona called Arco Santi, which was an amazing social experiment as well. And I feel like this project is just the continuation of a wave of massive projects that uh, we, we almost don't dare to dream of uh, at the moment. And what about you, Michelle? Do you have a view on whether it's a success or a failure? I was thinking of the famous Edison quote, I don't, I haven't failed, I've found a thousand ways it doesn't work. They definitely had a vision of more visits into the biosphere or more biospheres. There was a sense that the work was on a continuum. Um, well, there are two answers to that question. <laughs> Um, as a scientific experiment, it was a dismal failure, but I don't think it was a scientific experiment. And the clip that you showed earlier, um, that, that's, that's what was stated. It was really an exercise in trying to build a biosphere that people could live in and to see how, how to do that, work out how to do that, and then see how people coped really living inside inside of that. And the people that were in there, they would they they had scientific equipment there, they were taking measurements, they were studying things um, whilst they were in there. But um, let's just say from a scientific perspective, there was no rigor to any of any of that. Um, but I, I found I found the, the movie fascinating from the point of view that there were these amazing group of people doing all of the things that Ollie has described. You know, I, the, the backstory was just so fascinating and the, um, the ambition and the imagination to even come up with Biosphere 2 as a project, um, I, I was just gobsmacked that, that that happened at all. I don't know how they managed to wangle a billionaire in, into bankrolling it for them, but I, I, think, I think that it's a, a fantastic thing. It's very interesting, actually, Ollie, linking it to to capitalism, you know, to to financiers. Um, you know, it makes one wonder: does one need the vision of of an Elon Musk or a Richard Branson um, to make something like this happen? Is it actually connected with capitalism, despite the fact that these activists come from a from a very left, a very kind of hippie commune? counterculture kind of background so I, I think that that I think that that's interesting perhaps we'll play the clip that kind of shows the characters it's a very short clip just showing you know the unity of the group this is a way of learning by doing to be pushed to the limits of your skills The dome symbolized a unity that reflected the values of the ranch. The struts of a ball have tremendous strength together, but individually they don't have that kind of cohesive strength. That's how we worked. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. I think to your point, Michelle, What's interesting to me as a speculative fiction writer is that that this is how a novel works for me. It's not science. It's using kind of poetry or an imaginative artistic act of creativity to actually do this, what science fiction might call an act of kind of cognitive estrangement, which makes us re-see aspects of our own world or our own relationships so in this instance, you know, the biosphere becomes like a, a concrete metaphor that teaches us, that shows us what actually biosphere one, the earth, is like, that actually we are in a closed system, but we just can't see it. It's sort of, it's too big. You know, it's that, um, that hyper object that is too giant in space and time for our minds to process it. But by building this experiment, it kind of makes that relationship real 
the relationship with the earth in that first clip with you know walking into the rainforest and having that kind of feedback from that experience is kind of manifested sort of through this experiment um it's interesting one of the questions we had that was saying would you have a different mix of people for biosphere three would you have adventurers and artists and i was like but that's kind of what they had. <laughs> like, actually, they didn't have scientists. Um, this sort of learning by doing, you know, um, it, it's it's fine. It's not very efficient, you know. It, it means you have to kind of start from for sort of first principles again. But I find myself very attached to that. There's a moment when someone turns to someone else kind of sotto voce and says, it's all theatre, you know. Um, sort of everything that we're kind of looking at there. So I'm interested, I might ask both of you, in terms of your own work, in terms of your own practice, what do you take from an experience like this? Is there a way that it it inspires you, is entertainment light relief, um, makes you think of things that you don't want to have to do, or is there a way in which the way that this can just sit against our reality, there's a sort of a, a learning that we can take away from it? I might ask you first, Ollie. Yeah, I really like the, the as I said earlier, like I really like the can-do attitude and the positivity and, and, and all of this. I have to say that like in the design space, you would you would start this on a way smaller scale. Uh, you, so there's this notion of prototyping where you wouldn't put like millions and millions and millions of dollars like they did on the first uh, iteration of the Biosphere 2. Uh, I, I, I think here of like a project which is happening currently in New York where uh, three students decided that they wanted to swim in the East, East River, a uh, very polluted river. And it's been like uh, six, seven years that I'm following them up, following uh, um, their, their work. And they started with like a little... Um, a, a little um, prototype that was basically like 20 centimeter by 20 centimeter in order to test the, the feasibility of the filters in order to filtrate the dirty water of the East River. Uh, to this day, it's still not built and it's still working out on the financing and all of this. Um, but I would say like, I, I'm still impressed by the, by the, the, the grandeur of it all. Uh, I think, as I said earlier, I don't think we could do this nowadays. Uh, there's, a, there's more rigor than is to be put in place into uh, setting up this massive project. And piggyback it on what you said earlier, uh, there's a quote in the movie that I absolutely adore, which is a young kid uh, that just says, um, if, nothing can get, if nothing can get in and nothing can get out, how long can they last? And that's definitely a metaphor for me between Biosphere 1 and Biosphere 2 there uh, that I admire. Thank you. Michelle, I might just tweak the question slightly to you and sort of really to this question, I guess, that we're, we're heading towards is do we need to leave Earth? This sort of stated mission that, um, that they mention, which is the grounds where we say the data that they gathered is not necessarily very helpful, you know, about being um, planetarians, um, you know, and they were looking at, at at a situation that has only become more catastrophic in terms of crisis, the acute crisis of bushfires, global pandemic, anyone? Um, you know, current political implosions, those sort of hyper object, uh, wicked problems that we sort of mentioned before. Um, do we need to leave Earth? And and if this isn't the way in which we would look towards that that pathway, that future, what might we do? What What is happening now? Okay, look, I've got um, very firm views about this. Um, you might think as um, a scientist and aerospace engineer that I would be all for leaving Earth and going into outer space and colonising new planets. Um, but I, I, I think, no, we shouldn't be leaving. If you look at a lot of the activity currently around colonising the moon and using that as a launching pad to go to Mars, a big driver for that really is just mining. And if you think about the implications of that from a societal perspective and from a law and order perspective, we are just essentially transferring the problems of society, the problems that we currently face, just to another to another celestial body if we could work out a way to colonize mars which has a, an atmosphere that we can't breathe 
We don't know how to extract any water out of it, so how could we grow anything? If we're able to do that, certainly we're able to clean up the planet that we're currently on. So I firmly believe that the work that's going on in trying to colonize Mars and moving in those directions, it's not really about colonizing Mars, it's about other, it's about other things. We should be focusing a lot of that know-how back towards where we currently live and improving the conditions here. If you can have a colony fact, on Mars, you can have a colony. Sorry, Rose, I hadn't quite finished. I was just going to say, if you can have a colony on Mars that thrives, you could more easily have a colony in the middle of the desert somewhere that's also thriving. Yes, I agree. And in fact, that's what I was sort of referencing before, where the value of this experiment for me is that it does teach us quite a lot about that um, that that closed system, that symbiotic relationship that we actually have with the Earth that sometimes we don't see as clearly. And even um, the way in which there, there are issues of oxygen deprivation and um, overproduction of carbon dioxide not just has an impact on the, the biospherians, but the way that it actually impacts the crop cycles and so therefore the food, they eat, the way everything has that flow on effect, I think that that is something that is sort of the experiment sort of shows in a microcosm. But, but Ollie, I might ask you, what, what are your thoughts about this idea, you know, which is surely the biggest, most audacious idea of, um, of do we need to leave Earth? You know, is it something that we should be working towards or engaging with or entertaining in any way? Mm. Uh, there's two, 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 uh, two aspects to my response, I think. I think we should put into context um, the ideas of these guys back in the times that they were living in. So here we have, uh, we're dealing with like two people, really like the financier Bass and, uh, and the visionary man, uh, Alan. And they're, they're born in the, uh, maybe the, I don't know, the early 50s or something like that, 1950s, or maybe even before that, the 40s. And that means that they actually live through like um, the nuclearization of the world. Um, they leave. They were at university when um, when the, the the Cuban Bay of Pigs crisis happened, and then the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, of 1962, and that actually framed, in my opinion, their desire to potentially find a way to leave Earth if we had to. And I think that's why, like, uh, when they proposed that project, uh, I think that they were like concerned about the survival of the human race because everybody at the time was like scared about like what could nuclear war could do. Having said that, now we are in a very different time, um, and, and and I think like uh, it would be foolish to just say that we should leave Earth. Uh, wh when I look at like the, the the work that the design industry and the engineering industry and the science industry is doing, you can actually identify that we have today all the tech and the non-tech, all the knowledge. Uh, in order to face and deal with the climate emergency that we are living in. Um, there's something that jumps to mind here. There is, for example, everybody knows we are drowning into plastic. Um, they're, they're, they're terrible for the environment, they're terrible for our health, um, and they still are uh, the main uh, way to like package all the goods that we consume and, and all of this. Bioplastics, which are naturally biodegradable, um, have been discovered at the start of the 20th century. So in 1925 in France, there's a chemist that proposed the, um, that discovered uh, polyhydroxyalkanoates, which are a, uh, a biodegradable plastic that leaves no trace in the environment in three to six months. How come 95 years later, we still do not use this kind of technology and the oil lobby is just pushing us toward using more and more non-biodegradable plastic so that that's one thing and here like i think tim put something on on um, on screen uh, there is like plethora of new bioplastics that are emerging when are we going to start using them so i think like bioplastic is just one example but we actually have the tech and the non-tech that we need in order to deal with all the the, the situation that we have created over the years Michelle, yeah, Michelle, you've got a point, and then I'm going to butt in with a um, technical problem. <laughs> okay. 
One of the things to keep in mind is that a lot of technology doesn't get taken up because it, in a lab, on, a, it, it, on the lab scale, it works. But if you then have to scale it up in any, in any, to make it practical and widespread, oftentimes that scale up is, is um, more polluting than what you're, we currently have because the processes are different. Um, oftentimes it's much more expensive than what we currently have. So a lot of these things often get in the way of technologies being adopted. There are lots of technologies that are excellent technologies that, sh that just sit on the shelf gathering dust because of a, a whole lot of practical reasons that make them unfeasible. Go, Ollie. All right, we're on a road <laughs> roll. Go, Ollie. <laughs> <laughs> Totally agree with you, uh, Michelle. I think it's a very good point. But also, like what was fascinating when we observed the, the coronavirus crisis is, like for example, um, whereas back in the days, potentially, or just even before COVID nineteen times, uh, the creation of a vaccine was taking years and years and years. Here, we can see that when we put efforts to solve a specific issue, we can we can realize that um, we can actually do it much quicker, um, and that. Potentially, that's where we should put our efforts. If the climate emergency is becoming the main issue uh, of, of our times, um, uh, what political decision do we need to make in order to favor solutions that are going to benefit the environment and the, and the species on the planet? Michelle, just, I, just, I, pause, I, just, pause on, just pause on that thought, Michelle. I just, I really need to, because we've got people in the audience that I just need to talk to for a sec. So some people are having issues accessing the chat, apparently, according to Isabella. So our solution for this is if you can't access the chat in our the capital.tv website, just open the Vimeo in a, um, in a new window in your browser. So open the Vimeo link directly by clicking the Watch Now button instead of the image on our website. Um, and you will be able to access the chat in Vimeo directly. And we apologise and we will get our web technicians to fix that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just message Isabella directly on our Facebook and she will talk you through that. Um, and then Michelle's going to, hopefully you haven't lost your role, Michelle. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't. Um, I was just going to say, Ollie, I totally agree with you. Um, uh, Necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. And I think that, you know, with the coronavirus, everybody's worried that they're going to die. So, of course, there's a lot of activity. I think that with climate change, um, you talked about all of the plastic waste and how our legacy, you know, in, in millennia to come is that there's going to be a whole layer of plastic that people will dig up to, uh, to mark our existence, um, they're, not, they're not immediate concerns for most people, so it kind of gets pushed by the wayside. And, and I, I, you're right, it doesn't mean that if everybody worked together, they couldn't focus on a solution here and now. And we saw how, how easily um, some, of the, um, some of the climactic issues were, were helped during lockdown around the world. You know, dolphins returned to the canals of Venice and they hadn't been seen there for decades, for example. And no one did anything other than stay inside, you know, and stop, you know, driving boats through the canals and things like this. So mm. I, certainly things could be done, but it just doesn't, it isn't an urgent thing in most people's minds. I th which is thank a shame. you, Michelle. Yes. Yeah, that's exactly what I've been um, I've been writing on. I've been writing about dystopias, but I'm I'm not going to. Before I speak, I just thought we could show the clip around climate change and the education that the biospherians, the role that they played um, prior to um, to building the dome, building Spaceship Earth. We were doing conferences, and we held them in different parts of the world. They started with specific biomes, a conference on deserts, on oceans, on jungles. Pretty soon we ran out of biomes, so we did the planet Earth. Dr. Alexander King sounds a note of warning. 
We are living in an unusually warm period. The small overall temperature changes lead to ice age glaciation. Population increase concentrated in enormous cities, destruction of natural environment, and increasing disparity between rich and poor countries is leading to a catastrophe. Yet most of the destruction is caused by human ignorance. Changes were happening on an enormous scale. We were actually in danger of destroying the planet as we know it. We realized that we had to do something. Thank you very much, Dean. Any idea that can be conceived in our time can be executed in our time. It's a hell of a mantra. Phil Hawes, our resident architect, came up with a Adobe spaceship. The idea of making an enclosed mini world rose from that moment. And in this biospheric bank are thousands of species of life and native people. They better be adventurers, they better be artists, and they better be scientists. We loved this idea that when you start to think of colonies in space, suddenly you are thinking of sustainable living on Earth. Thank you. God, I love that line, any idea that can be conceived in our time can be executed in our time. It makes me think of the very famous um, speculative fiction writer, Margaret Atwood, who would say that she is not a speculative fiction writer, the author of The Handmaid's Tale, because she says everything in that book could happen somewhere in the world now. It doesn't require a different future. It doesn't require a different um, technology, you know, a different world. So the question I'd like to ask you guys is, are we living in a dystopia? Um, if we look at where they were then and if we look at where we are now, and I can't help but think about the election. <laughs> Perhaps I'll throw to you first, Ollie. Um, you've used the term with me before, a heterotopia. Perhaps you might um, like to talk a little bit about the idea of topias and the idea of of that idea of how that actually in itself kind of functions um, and, and how you, you see where we are now, where the biospherians were then, where we might be jumping ahead another couple of decades. There's so many things I could say about this. Okay, so um, <laughs> first of all, we need to acknowledge the fact that there's not one reality, but many. And because reality is just the sum of one's personal experiences, right? So uh, the reality of me here in Melbourne is very different from somebody that lives in a different place, in a different culture, in a different socioeconomic context. Um, and so based on these realities, um, some people live in dystopias, some people live in, uh, in protopias, some, somewhere in between uh, utopia, the, literally the place that do not exist, but is ideal, and uh, a full dystopia as we think about it. Um, I think the media are playing a, a big role in everybody thinking that uh, we are in a dystopia. There's actually so many good things that are happening in the world, so many things that we could do in order to get out of the uh, climate crisis, uh, waste accumulation, biodiversity loss, um, uh, social inequalities throughout the world, all of this. Um, so I'm actually very realistic about what's happening in the world, but I'm also very optimistic. And um, whereas back in the days, uh, my, my, my practice was mainly uh, uh, very future focused, very speculative, designing speculative futures, I'm changing that quite a bit now. Because as a realist, uh, um, all, the, all the science is showing to us that uh, in about 10 years time, we're gonna reach a point of non-return where we might not be able to really control uh, the climate and the, the climate is gonna control us. And so instead of talking about, instead of talking about speculative futures, I'd like, I'm, I'm talking more and more about um, alternative realities. What could we do differently in the present? If we were to go back in time and branch out from our current timelines, where would we end up? And these places are called heterotopias, the other place, literally. Uh, it's a term that was coined by a uh, philosoph philosopher Foucault in France uh, uh, a few decades ago. And, uh, and it's something which I think is becoming a, a, a lot more interesting to talk about in my in my industry rather than uh, uh, long-term speculative futures. There's too many things to like solve at the moment uh, to talk about like to really focus on long, long-term. I'm not saying like not everybody should not every, 
um, I'm not saying this is a bad practice, but I reckon there's a lot to do in designing these heterotopias that could help us um, uh, live in a different way or branch out from our current timelines. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, Margaret Atwood, she uses the term us-topias. She's like, it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's a far bigger onus on us. Um, Michelle, I wonder if you want to sort of speak to that as well from your perspective. One of the things we've got here today, I was just thinking between the three of us and these different areas, it's a little bit like the mix up in Spaceship Earth, <laughs> but we've got a lot more science <laughs> on the panel perhaps. <laughs> um, so do I think we're living in a dystopia? So I was, I was thinking about this as Ollie was talking and, you know, as an individual, I lead a very happy life. You know, I've got everything I need. I've got good people around me. Nothing much really is going wrong. But I think if you sort of step outside of that and you look at things such as what's go going on in the United States um, and, you know, it's, is it really that much better here in Australia? Um, the direction that we're taking with, um, with climate change and the inaction associated with that, um, the push to mine asteroids and mine the moon, which is just a displacement of a lot of the of a lot of the things that we're doing on Earth that are destroying the planet. I actually do think we are living in a dystopia. But it's kind of like what I was saying before, you know, if the the general inaction is because on a day-to-day -day basis as individuals, we've got everything around us that we need here in here in Australia. Um, we lead we lead charmed lives in many ways. But uh, I don't think you can get around the, the reality of what's going on politically around the world in many, many parts of the world and the increase, the increasing discord between between societies within within the same country and the um, the problems that our, our planet faces in terms of the climate and also running out of resources, the resources that we use to make the computers that we're currently on, for example, they're, they're, a, they're not re renewable resources. There are lots of rare earth metals that are used in the electronics of our smartphones and our computers. That's going to run out. This is part of what's driving um, the driving the notion of, the, of us mining celestial bodies. We're just transplanting a way of life elsewhere, which doesn't work. I think that um, that really speaks to my experience of being a speculative fiction writer during a global pandemic, where the, the in January of this year I was writing for a chapter for a book on dystopias and it was on pandemics as futuristic. I was writing on Meg Mundell's The Trespassers, that, you know, the pandemic uh, in that book, you know, it's it's the refugee crisis, it's a metaphor, and and then it it is not a metaphor anymore. And I think that that experience also um, kind of harks back to the bushfires last summer and the experience of, of being in Sydney and having, you know, smoke on the water or, you know, being in, in Melbourne, you know, being down on the beach and having smoke, you know, in your garden where you're being advised to keep your children inside. And there's that sort of sense to perhaps to speak back to what you said before, Ollie, about the future is here but only some of us can afford it. But maybe it's actually flipping that that wealth balance and kind of going sort of the opposite. The future is here for those of us who can't afford to keep it out. Um, you know, and, and maybe, you know, if if the isolation and corona, the, this process has, has got any benefits and, and the, my jury is out on that one, possibly it doesn't. But, you know, maybe one of the things is that it does question those everyday luxuries of, oh, I can't get my coffee in my cafe. Actually, you know, my small decisions of, you know, getting toilet paper or whatever are impacted. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I guess that that's an area in which I see, you know, speculative fiction kind of butting up against the real world and there are a rising influence in, 
in that genre or these experiments which are not realistic in themselves, not based on science, and yet they kind of help us process, um, you know, what we are kind of going through. Um, I realise that we're coming up to, to, to question time, but I did just want to ask one more thing, and we might show the clip about, um, about the leader of this cult, which the documentary doesn't really um, position as a cult, um, but I, I wonder about how we how much charismatic leaders are needed to get these ventures up and running. And and again, I can't help but think of this in the um, uh, in the context of, of the election. The charismatic leader can go either way. But perhaps we'll just look that little um, clip from the documentary. We were workaholics, running the ranch and the theater. <laughs> Johnny was a very good leader, and he instilled that. If you feel that you've been given permission to go do any kind of a task, no matter, almost no matter what it is, you'll do it. I was also thinking of that, um, of that clip Rose, as you just before you mentioned, I was like, we have to show the, uh, the fearless leader clip because it certainly is relevant right now. Um, so to our audience at home, you if you ha have a burning question and you haven't put it in the chat, pop, pop it in now, or you might um, you might think of something as everyone's talking. Um, Ollie, there's a question from Vanessa in London. Hello, Vanessa in London. Um, she says, love what Ollie is saying. This was quite early on in the discussion. Um, this way about this wave is almost something that we can dream of now. And she'd be curious to hear your thoughts on what um, a new wave or new waves are coming up um, that you're seeing on the edges. Um, does that, I hope that connects to... But it was quite far back in the conversation. So if you if you can't remember, uh, that's fine. Are we talking about are we talking about new waves of coronavirus? Is that correct? I, I don't think know. It was she the didn't waves that. of audacious projects, waves of world yeah. imagination. You said one in India, one in. <laughs> I was thinking of that that Japanese project to build a dome world under the water, and I think there's something happening tropically. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I mean, like they're, they're happening like all the time. I think like they're just taking a lot more time to to put in place, and uh, there's a lot more hurdles in order to achieve such a project on such grandeur. Uh, what was fantastic about the biosphere is like it's just two guys that decided to do something, and one had the vision and one had the money, and they were like, "Let's go, let's bankroll this, and let's make it happen," um, which I think was fantastic. Um, I, in today's world, it feels like that that's unlikely to happen very often, and maybe potentially it wasn't happening that often anyway in the past neither. Um, but I'm hoping, like, yes, we, we should be more adventurous. We should be uh, more daring into uh, uh, the futures we are proposing. Um, there's like a, in design, there's a good conversation which is happening. It's like a behavioral change is the, the most interesting aspect of design, yet the, the, the least utilized. How, we do, how do we design for this behavioral change? What mega project do we need to put in place in order to like uh, put us on the right track for our survival? Thanks, Molly. Yeah, um, Vanessa was just adding that you, it was when you were mentioning how free everyone was experimenting, but that's fine. I think we, um, I think we picked up the, the gist of that. Um, Hi, Michelle, Vanessa. I'm going to ask. <laughs> um, uh, Michelle, I'm going to ask you this one, but Ollie, you might have something to weigh in. And I'm just going to paraphrase because um, it's just the question's been broken up when it was sent in. So um, according to where we are now in our, I guess, climate and Earth scenario, they're asking what percentage of humans are Earth friendly. Um, it's just a funny way of saying how many, how many of us can survive here. Um, and then how soon will this scenario get worse or how quickly will this scenario get worse and how quickly should we pre prepare ourselves for those scenarios? I assume that basically the scenarios are getting worse. So how many humans can we fit? Well, well you know, I have, <laughs> have been known to say um, in the past 
that we there are t the problem with our planet is that there are too many people and what we need is a good pandemic um and now that we have a pandemic i feel very bad that i said that um but i think that the time is already here yes there are too many people this is not i know that that pandemics seem to come around once every hundred years but the reality is that's it's going to be much more frequent because of our higher population because the natural habitats of wildlife are so reduced so the crossover of viruses from one species to another is amplified and much it's just much more frequent so we're going to see this again it's not it's not going to be another hundred years before we have something else like the coronavirus. So the time is already here. The time's passed. We need to we need to do things now, and there are way too many people. So we need to work out how to sustain the population that we have, and um, and try to halt the the deterioration around us. That could truly be like you know. A year-long conference for us so I, I think we need to like put pause on Ollie do you have something die are you dying to say something Ollie was that a hand up oh, do, yeah just just one little thing mm -hmm. I think that yes there's a conversation about the, the size of the population but there's also like a conversation about our consumption behaviors um, a, a family in the mid in the Midwest potentially in America that might be way more polluting than some family in different geographical context um, and so more than, than just having like one liver of, of, of the size of the population, it's how much we consume and what we consume as well. So if we were to provide sustainable choices to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to people on this planet, uh, potentially uh, we wouldn't need to control population. Mm. That's where those algae buildings that I invented for you came in, the ones that I said that's probably <laughs> completely wrong. Um, I'm going to read a question just off, off the chat, so just excuse me while I look at, at my other screen. It's from Tanya. Um, Rose, this question is tapping into the question we haven't asked about big business interfering. I, we did feel like that was going to be a whole other controversial panel, but let's go with this question. Tanya says, I think the shutdown, profiteering and the ban on stepping in was the most gut-wrenching event. How do we protect this kind of work? So I guess she's saying, how do we protect the biosphere ends kind, kind of work? Um, Ollie, do you want to start with that one? Okay, sorry, can you repeat that question? I just had a bug in my, in my yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. So Tanya was saying that she thinks how the biosphere got shut down and not oh, all yeah, of the okay. profiteers and the bans and the and the commercial interference that was the most gut wrenching part of this story. And how do we protect the actual goal of the work? Yeah. Oh, that like in the movie was kind of uh, fascinating. Like just Goldman Sachs just arrived and then took over, <laughs> took possession of all the data and didn't release them back to the the, the people that were involved in into creating this data. And I'm quite surprised about that. I would say, like the, the and also funnily enough, the, the the new CEO of Biosphere after the after the two years of lockdown was actually Steve Bannon, uh, which was like the climate advisor of the Trump administration, which is highly uh, and uh, non-climate aware. And in 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 one way, um, 30 years before, in 1993, he, he proved to the world that he was actually aware of what was happening already in the world in terms of climate emergency. And so it's kind of fascinating. Fascinating this, this bit of the story as well and the twist that happened at the end of the biosphere. Uh, I wish we actually had access to this data because that would be the best data to build biosphere. Three, four, five, as the, the plan was always the case when they, they set up to, to build that thing to start with. And as Tim, our trusted production, um, production person in the background here is saying Cambridge Analytica. Tim doesn't have a voice or a face, <laughs> but he is here in the background. Um, Rose, here we have a creative question for you. Hi, Rose. This is from Neil. Hi, Rose. There hasn't been any mature Australian space opera shows since Farscape in 2003. In your opinion, will the Australian market ever embrace something made here that is like Babylon 5 or Battlestar Galactica? Or are novels the only way these days? <laughs> it's, a, it's a thought through question. Um, 
I think that it's it's quite interesting. It touches on a lot of markets, a publishing market, a uh, an entertainment market, um, our you know capabilities to make those kinds of series, those kinds of films. I think that Australia is just perfect for end of the world, futuristic. Um, I think that you know that this is where all of our creative energies you know should be poured i think tim Re tim winton should be writing climate fiction um you know all of the sort of the great artistic work should go in these directions but the fact is we come from a very strong anglo-saxon culture that prioritizes realist literary fiction realist popular fiction you know crime outback noir is our biggest export at the moment and so there just isn't a sense of the appetite coming from those kind of genre areas given the population in our market. But I would say, go for it. Be a, be a biosphere and get your seven pals together, lock yourself in a room for, for two years and, um, and, and come out with exactly that story. It would fly. <laughs> <laughs> um, we just have a comment from Tony Roberts. Hi, Tony. Um, I think it was leading on from what Ollie was saying. So it's a comment and a question. She says, I think humans lack imagination in relation to time scales beyond our lifespans and um, and the, I'm assuming that means immediate time span. Um, I take an evolutionary perspective in my speculative work as a lens um, as a lens on the present. Climate change is happening faster than we can adapt to it. Are there other ideas to communicate this urgency? How do we communicate the urgency when we're, when we are not going to live beyond uh, to see the results? That's like um, that's such an interesting question. Thanks for asking, Tony. Um, there was something that were existing back in the days when uh, people were building cathedrals, for example. And uh, the lifespan of human was way shorter than the time that was spent on building that uh, monument. And so it was generations of people building these massive, uh, beautiful buildings. That and, and the people that started it didn't see the end of it. So what was driving them to believe in such a project, to believe in, uh, in building things that they will not see the fruit of it? Um, so this this mentality is called cathedral thinking, and I think it's a uh, it's linking back to beliefs and ritual. And um, we're becoming a, as a society over the world like a, a lot individualistic, a lot more individualistic. Um, there's like there's there's a lack of belief in in the group, and uh, and I would say like uh, it's interesting to see at the moment the return to um, what's called like ecologic spirituality. Uh, where uh, Mother Earth and Pakanism are almost coming, resurfacing as a conversation with the need to deal with the climate emergency. So, yeah, I would say the answer to that is in, a, 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 in beliefs and rituals, of a societal beliefs and ritual. Mm. And novels. Michelle? <laughs> yes, and novels. And movies. Um, Michelle, do, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, um, no, no, I've got, got I've not got much to add to that, actually, Gita. That's all right. I've got a silly one from someone for you, Michelle. Do you believe there, oh, or maybe it's not silly, do you believe there is intelligent life on Mars and if so, what would you say to it? <laughs> I want to go back and talk about Babylon 5. Um, <laughs> do I think there's, do I think there's intelligent life on Mars? Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we all come from Mars. So if I was to to meet some intelligent life from uh, from Mars, I'd probably say, "Hi, Grandma." <laughs> that one was from. Um, I like that. Sorry, I didn't say the name. It was from Morgan. I don't, I don't know if Morgan's sitting in the chat. Um, Rose, you had a question that didn't get asked about what. Um, what everyone would like to know or see that was left out of the doco. And tomorrow morning we've got our masterclass with the director, Matt Wolf. So I will be talking to him about the, you know, thousands of hours of footage that he mined through to make this film because, of course, everything, um, everything, all the decisions that were made in a film about what you see, there's thousands of just, um, things that you don't see. Um, but maybe the audience and maybe if the three of you just want to ruminate on what, what would you like to know more of, Rose, I think you, you were wondering about the bags that came in and what was in them. Do you want to talk more about what you were wondering? Yeah. 
I'm very interested in the difference between we're talking a lot about the experiment and not necessarily the documentary. And one of the things I'm really interested in is the way those two things sit together. So I mentioned the documentary as a kind of a reclamation of history, of it changing the perception of an event. And I'm very interested in that, how you could write about an event and see it from a different point of view. But one of the things I found watching the documentary is I was continually intrigued by narrative strands that were not pursued because it wasn't that kind of story. You know, there's there's one passing reference to a potential relationship. Well, yeah. well, you know, wow. <laughs> um, someone goes out for a medical emergency and comes back with these black duffel bags. Um, you know, there were sort of these these range of of sort of teasers that that you know don't get kind of unpacked. I even was very interested in this moment. I was quite obsessed by it actually. This moment where one of the biospherian talks about, and she's talking about this this deep connection that they're having with the earth in this enclosed environment, and she pulls a potato out of the earth, and there's a a puff of carbon dioxide, and I was like, is that is that real? Uh, is that possible that 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 would, or is that just poetic? And if she's saying she's a scientist and she's collecting data then wouldn't she, you know, so there were just these moments that I f sort of felt like the, the documentary was either gifting them to me just for my kind of imagination or was quite consciously almost whitewashing these opportunities to kind of get much more sort of reality TV about it. I'd be interested to know, perhaps Michelle, were there moments like that for you where you went, there's a, there's a rabbit hole there that I'd quite like to go down? Yeah, I, I, I'm with you, Rose. I kind of, um, I wanted to get to know the people in there a little bit more and get to, to me it was, it, it was almost like, it was like reality TV. It was like watching Big Brother. You know, you've got some strangers confined to a, a space and how are they all getting along with each other? We got a sense that maybe it wasn't so harmonious at one point, particularly when, there was um, an ex excess carbon dioxide hanging around, so they weren't breathing, breathing properly. And there was, um, they all got very, very thin because there wasn't very much food. But you know, the, the, it, it just, it never really focused on that. To me, it was, it was a big part of how we might live in these confined spaces. It's about how the people interact with each other. And I would have liked to see a lot more of that. And I, I, I found myself wanting to hear more about that. I think there was too much of the backstory. I really liked the backstory. I think that's a documentary mm. unto itself. I, I would have preferred the doco to focus a lot more on what was going on inside inside the dome. Yep. Um, I'll ask I'll ask Matt about that tomorrow, Michelle. I don't know if you're free at ten a.m. You can come along. Okay. Um, Ollie. Okay. <laughs> Ollie, do you? Uh, so yeah. Were there any? Same for me, it was the relationship between the people. And I almost want to not answer that question, but ask the question to Michelle. Like in the space programs nowadays, is there a lot of work done uh, to like um, build like strong communities, strong groups uh, that we know are going to work in space when they're in isolation for a long time or, or what's happening? Well, the, the biggest groups um, in space currently are the, the groups on the um, International Space Station. So there's usually, you know, about four people there at any one time. And um, a big component of selection is around how people will get on with each other, how they will interact as a team. That's a big part of the selection. So, yes, mm. yes. I was really interested in the the um, the kind of theatre aspect of it and how that might relate to the maintaining healthy relationships in this artificial environment. You know, like um, almost like as a kind of therapy, they did this performance before they went in about you know, everything that could go wrong. And you know, there seemed to be you know you, you you could read a lot of stuff about how you know people that sing together or dance together. You know, there are ways in which these outlets are kind of. Um, you know, the emotions are kind of rinsed or, or sort of pushed through these experiences. Um, and I sort of wondered, did that continue on into the environment? And it, did that footage then just not fit the, the mission of the documentary, which was really to reclaim it and say that it was quite scientific? But actually, was there all this documentary of them just being like totally loopy 
when these windows all around, you know, where they just like <laughs> dancing through the desert. Yeah, there was there were a few scenes when I was doing some of the clips yesterday. There were a few scenes. There was like short moments and montages of them doing their synchronized dancing and performing for the tourists that were were paying, you know, and buying merch. But um, yeah, it, it definitely, I'll definitely check in with Matt tomorrow and see what percentage was crazy, like naked dancing in the biodome, and what percentage was doing experiments on the carbon dioxide emitted by a potato yeah <laughs> or, or in their red jumpsuits <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah i forgot to introduce all the, stand up again um rose has got a spaceship earth jumpsuit on so which was made for yeah so anyway rose she's become a biosphere um i think I think because it's almost seven o'clock, we're gonna we're gonna um, wrap this up. But unless anyone has any lasting any last um, comments or, um, or yeah or anything you want to say, and and before we go, we we're gonna have a look at the um, footage of the Australian. I'm forgetting what it's called now. It's the um, Downs. Someone. Yeah, I'll have to look at my notes. It's the essentially where the group was researching in Australia. We've got a little bit of footage of that of that place in the outback. Um, but, yeah, thank you so much. That that was so interesting. And as I said, we, you know, we could take any one of those questions and, and talk to it, but, you know, on its own for an hour. Um, I'm just looking at the audience. Yeah. Go, Rose, the Biosphereian. They're all cheering you on, Rose. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to shout out to Isabella, who is my production assistant, and she's on all the comms. She's monitoring the chat at the moment. Tim, who you can't see behind the scenes. Eric, who you also can't see behind the scenes. Um, Dot Play and Madman, who um, who own the film. And, um, of course, uh, our audience and the three of you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, stick around and watch. Just Tim, maybe we'll just play that that clip as we wave, as we wave off into the sunset. Thanks, Gita. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everyone. Kimberley of Western Hi. Australia. Thank you. Just 12 kilometres outside of the town of Derby with all season access off a paved road. Bird would down. <laughs> Started in 1978 by the Institute of Ecotechnics, a good portion of the property was planted with drought-tolerant grasses and legumes to improve pastures. For a decade, Birdwood Downs operated as a seed production farm. Today, research is in native species with economic potential. Rustic bungalows and quiet campgrounds offer a unique stay on a working station. <laughs>